Today is January 7th, 2023. The time is 1136 AM. And I want to express my thoughts about um, Osama bin Laden's father, Mohammed um, bin Laden. I'm going to be reading an article out of Salon. The title is The Making of Osama the making of Osama bin Laden by Jason Burke. And this article was published November 2nd, 2001, November 1st, 2001. And I'm really interested in this. And it says in 1930, a powerfully built dockside laborer, six feet tall and with one eye, decided there was more to life than loading ships in the ports of his poverty-stricken native province of Hadramat in Yemen. He packed a bag, bought a place on a camel caravan heading to the newly created kingdom of Saudi Arabia and set off on a thousand mile track to seek his fortune. The man who would become, the man who would go on to father a terrorist sought by the military might of the Western world got his first job as a bricklayer with Aramico, the the Arabian American oil company, earning a single Saudi real, about 15 cents a day. He lived frugally, saved hard, invested well, and went into business himself. By the early 1950s, Mohammed bin Laden was employed in building palaces for the House of Saud in Riyadh. He won the the contracts by heavily undercutting local firms. It was a gamble that paid off. Bin Laden, Bin Laden got his big break. Bin Laden's big break came when a foreign contractor withdrew from a deal to build the Medina Jeddah Highway, and he took on the job. By the early 1960s, he was a rich man and an extraordinarily one. He couldn't read or write and signed his name with a cross all his life. But he had an extraordinary intelligence, said a French engineer who worked with him in the 1960s. The engineer remembered that the former laborer never forgot his roots, always leaving home with a wad of notes to give to the poor. You know, and just one other thing here. Um, Though at one stage he was rich enough to bail out the royal family when they fell on hard times, the teddy bag he had carried when he left Yemen remained on display at the palatial family home. He was killed when his helicopter crashed in 1968. I don't believe any of this. I don't. I don't believe any of this. I don't even believe that Mohammed Ben Laden, okay, I don't believe this man exists. I I just don't believe he exists. And that, I mean, that says a lot because for one, he, he, he was, he was handicapped and he was alleged to be a builder. And another thing that makes me believe that this person does not exist is that he could not read or write and signed his name with a cross all his life. And he was a billionaire and he couldn't read or write. But most importantly, he was supposed to be a builder. He was from poor means. Where did he get the money to start a business that would become so successful that he would um, loan money to the royal family. It says that he would loan, it says though at one stage he was rich, though at one stage he was rich enough to bail out the royal family when they fell on hard times. I don't believe any of this. I believe that Mohammed bin Laden 
is not a real human being. He was made up. And it said that he got his big break. Bin Laden's big break came when a foreign contractor withdrew from a deal to build the Medina Jetta Highway and he took on the job. Well, this is the Medina Jetta Highway that I found. I don't believe an uneducated man could undercut local businesses to build this. Where did he, number one, where did he get his money? How long did it take him to do it? Where did he get the materials to build it? Most importantly, where did he get the skills to build this? I don't think he existed. Wikipedia says Mohammed bin Laden was poor and uneducated and became a royal builder. I don't believe it. I don't believe it. I believe he was a, this is make believe, fake news, fake news. Mohammed bin Laden, Osama bin Laden's father does not exist. Mohammed bin Laden does not exist. I do not believe a poor, uneducated man can become a royal builder. I don't believe it. And I don't believe Ob Osama bin Laden exists either. And, and I'm going to give you the reasons why. Because he was born 1957. I was born in 1957. And in 1979, Osama bin Laden was 22 years old. And based upon this, I mean, it's just like, I don't believe this. It says here, shortly after the Soviet Union invaded Afghanistan in 1979, bin Laden, who viewed the invasion as an act of aggression against Islam, began traveling to meet Afghan resistance leaders and raise funds for the resistance. By 1984, his activities were centered mainly in Afghanistan and Pakistan, where he collaborated with Azam to recruit and organized Arab volunteers to fight the Soviet occupation. Bin Laden's financial resources, along with his reputation for piety and for bravery in combat, enhanced his stature as a militant leader. A computer database he created in 1988, listing the names of volunteers for the Afghan war, led to the formation that year of a new militant network named Al-Qaeda. Although the group remained without clear objectives or an operational agenda for several years. I don't believe that. I mean, he was doing way too much. He was a recruiter. He recruited. He was fighting against the Soviets. The United States is always fighting against the Soviets. So the United States, Osama bin Laden was fighting against the Soviets. The United States was also fighting against the Soviets in the, the Soviet Afghan war. So in this war, according to this Britannica article, Osama bin Laden created a database. I mean, back in that day, he was using, um, if he was using a, a PC, a personal computer, he was using Microsoft disk operating system with the big floppy disk, or he had a compact disk. But he had a lot of, he would need to, to, in order to even create this database, he would need data people to do the data entry. And he would need all of the co uh, computer supplies, the electricity, I mean, storage. He would need so much. There's a lot of stuff he would need. He would need a telephone system. He would need a call center to help maintain the database. To take to maintain the the recruitment process, everybody would need to have telephones because there weren't cell phones, there was no internet, there was something sort of, but it was not functional everywhere. So that alone tells me that Osama bin Laden really does not exist. And nineteen, the article goes on further to say. That in 1989, following the Soviet withdrawal from Afghanistan, bin Laden returned to Saudi Arabia, where he was initially welcomed as a hero. 
but he soon came to be regarded by the government as a radical and a potential threat. In 1990, the government denied his request for permission to use his network of fighters to defend Saudi Arabia against the threat of invasion posed by Saddam Hussein's Iraq. Bin Laden was outraged when Saudi Arabia relied instead on U.S. troops for protection during the Persian Gulf War, leading a leading to a growing rift between bin Laden and the country's leaders. And in 1991, he left Saudi Arabia, settling in Sudan at the end of the year. Okay, this doesn't even make sense. This man, he's going to be, he wants to protect Saudi Arabia from Iraq or from, from Saddam Hussein. I mean, are you really serious? Did, did this man really, I mean, how did this man approach the, the Saudi king and say, hey, you know, I want to, I mean, God, he must be some kind of schizophrenic to think that his database of fighters, he can, where, how would he do this? What, what are the logistics in place for him to be able to mobilize enough equipment? Where do you, first of all, where do you get the skills? I mean, his father had one eye, no education, but yet he could build palaces. Here's Sa- uh, Osama bin Laden, no skills in the military, but yet he can recruit he can train, he can excavate and penetrate caves with sophistication. I don't believe any of this. I, I simply do not believe this. That Saddam, Osama bin Laden had the power to do the things that they're alleging that he did created a database, recruited troops. And now here is a government document. Get right to the top of this government document. Senate prints from the U.S. government print publishing office, 11th session, Committee on Foreign Relations, John Kerry, first session, November 30th, 2009. And I know my highlights are gone, but I just want to go right here where it says. Okay. Right here, let's read this. Tora Bora is a district about 30 miles southeast of Jalalabad. Rather than a single place, the name covers a fortress-like section of the White Mountains that stretches about six miles long and six miles wide across a collection of narrow valleys, snow-covered ridge lines, and jagged peaks reaching 14,000 feet. During the 1980s, when he was fighting the Soviets in Afghanistan, bin Laden turned the site into a formidable stronghold. He built a rough he built a rough road from Jalalabad and brought in heavy equipment to fortify the natural caves and dig new ones. He supervised the excavation of connecting tunnels so fighters could move unseen be- between locations and the fights against the Soviet troops. Of course, the United States was covertly in Afghanistan assisting the Mujahideen the Afghan insurgents. So bin Laden was there too. So if bin Laden was recruiting um, volunteers to fight the Soviets, then the United States and bin Laden had to be crossing paths. They had to, because they're on the same team. They're fighting a common enemy, who? The Soviet Union. Now it says that he built, when he came, okay, it says, Torah Boros, he, he built a, he built a road, 
He built a road from Jalabad and brought in heavy equipment to fortify the natural caves and dig new ones. How long did this take? This is what the Torbora Caves look. Here's Jalalabad. He said that he said to build a road from Jalalabad to Torbora. This is what the terrain looks like from Torbora. I don't believe this happened. How much time did it take? How did he get the equipment up there? He had to be operating out in the open. This is not for real. This is just not something that actually happened. It goes on to say, after the defeat of the Soviet Union in 1989, bin Laden left Afghanistan and eventually set up the operations of his fledgling terrorist organization in the northeastern Afghan nation of Sudan. After pressure from the United States, Sudan expelled bin Laden in 1996, and he flew with his wives and children to Lalabad on a chartered jet. Upon his return to Afghanistan, bin Laden began expanding the fortress at Tora Bora, building base camps at higher elevations for himself, his wives, and numerous children, and other senior al-Qaeda figures. Some rooms were reported to be concealed 300 feet inside the granite peaks. The mountain sides leading to these, those upper reaches were steep and pitted with well-built bunkers cloaked in camouflage. In the years that followed, Bin Laden got to know the surrounding geography well from spending hours on long hikes with his children, his familiarity with the worn trails used over the centuries by traders and smugglers to transverse the few miles into Pakistan would serve him well. I don't believe any of this. I don't believe any of this. He's doing too much. It takes time to climb these mountains and to bring in heavy equipment. I mean, what type of equipment? What, you, did you use a helicopter that can transport heavy equipment? I mean, he's just doing way too much to be hiding from Western militaries, the U.S. I mean, he's a fugitive. He's, he's bombing things. He's hurting hu Americans. But yet he's operating out in the open. He's building, he's building roads from J Jalalabad. He built a road from Jalalabad to, he built a, from Jalalabad to the Tora Bora Caves. He brought in heavy equipment. I don't believe this. I see this as a lie. I mean, I, I, I'm, here's some more pictures of the Tora Bora Caves. You see up here, Tora Bora Caves, May 22nd. This is Tora Bora. I, I, I simply don't, I simply don't believe any of this. I, I, I just simply don't, I simply do not believe any of this. That even Bin Laden, I don't even think he existed. I think he's just a means to an end. He's a tool that's used. Here's something else that's reported by WikiLeaks, Tora Bora. July 22nd, 20, July 22nd and 29, 1983, Operation of Tora Bora of the 66th motorized rifle brigade. The base at Tora Bora was developed as a CIA finance complex built for the Mujahideen following the 1979 Soviet invasion of Afghanistan and has been described by the Western media as an impregnable cave fortress housing 2,000 men complete with a hospital, a hydroelectric power plant, offices, a hotel, arms and ammunition stores, roads large enough to drive a tank into, and sophisticated tunnel and ventilation systems. During the U.S. invasion of Afghanistan, the cave complex was one of the strongholds of the Taliban and Al-Qaeda. According to United States Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld, it was the location of the December 2001 Battle of Tora Bora and suspended a suspected hideout of Al-Qaeda leader Osama bin Laden. It was reported that in 2007, U.S. intelligence suspected bin Laden planned to meet with top Al-Qaeda and Taliban commanders at Tora Bora. 
prior to the launch of a possible attack on Europe or the United States. I don't believe any of this about the existence of Osama bin Laden. He was doing way too much. He was the recruiter. He created, I mean, he was training people. He was maintaining a antiquated database. Um, there's no logistics here. And, and, and his father, for his father to be so rich that he could, though at one stage he was rich enough to bail out the royal family when they fell on hard times, but yet there's hardly any information about him. You know, their are headshots. There are caricatures of him, but there is not enough data to support that he even existed. I mean, there's nothing about the Bin Laden group that would say, yeah, this is true. This is a real person. Just based upon what I'm observing, I don't think Bin Laden exists. Osama bin Laden exists, and I don't think Osama bin Laden's father, Mohammed bin Laden, existed. I think it's all fake news. I'm going to leave it.